we know and we grow democracy. In the, in the next few minutes, I would like to do three things. I mean, first I'll outline why and how international idea engages with democracy in the United States. Second, I'll describe some of the trends that we see affecting US democracy. And third, I'll give you an overview of the rest of this event. When international idea studies and assesses democracy, we do so at country level, but also in comparative perspective. In other words, we look for local nuance while applying the lessons we learn from our work around the world. And this allows us to connect the dots, noting how trends are different or consistent across time and across space. It is for this region, among many others, that international idea has always paid close attention to democratic conditions in the United States. As the world's most powerful democracy political events in the US have a disproportionate influence on the fate of democracy globally. No democracy is perfect, and US democracy has long been flawed. Yet, it is also true, albeit seldom remarked, that the second half of the 20th century was a period of unparalleled expansion for democracy globally, largely because the United States, the world's preeminent geopolitical power, was a liberal democracy. Through two world wars and the Cold War, the US fought for democracy and ensured its survival against authoritarian alternatives. While the US has struggled to fulfill its democratic promise at home and carries a troubling record of political and military interventions abroad, there is no question in my mind that it has been the greatest force and the loudest voice for democracy in the world. Two years ago, International IDEA expanded our engagement with the United States by opening an office in Washington, D.C. Around the same time, the two events were connected. We were also pleased to welcome the United States as an official observer of International IDEA. These two steps have improved our access and relevance to American decision makers, which in turn bolsters our understanding of US, US policy trends and of the country's ability to further or hinder the cause of democracy in the world. So what do I see when I look at US democracy today? I see a mixed picture at best. Now, if you ask me on a gloomy day like today, I do see many, many reasons to be concerned. Over the past decade, and probably well before that, the US, uh, US democracy has faced serious challenges. You don't have to take my word for it. According to our own global state of democracy indices, even though the U.S. performs in the high range in all four categories of democracy that we measure, namely representation, rights, rule of law, and participation. The country experienced a historic dip in many key indicators between 2017 and 2022. During this period, the U.S. was among the group of countries that most visibly experienced the erosion of democratic institutions and norms. This process culminated dramatically in the political violence of January 6, 2021, rooted in unfounded claims of electoral fraud that continue to poison American political debates. Since then, a few of the indicators that we measure have improved significantly, and citizen participation levels have remained very robust. Indeed, the country ranks eighth in the world when it comes to participation, thanks especially to the high civic engagement that has been a hallmark of American democracy since the time of Alexis de Tocqueville. 
But many other gauges of democratic health remain below their pre-2016 levels with factors related to political and economic equality scoring especially low. Political polarization continues to run amok, and according to many surveys, a large section of the public appears to have lost a trust in the democratic system, thereby increasing its vulnerability. The upcoming presidential and congressional elections will take place amid this complex set of conditions. And undoubtedly, regardless of the result, they will have global ramifications. Fortunately, we have a stellar guide to help us unpack this complexity and understand what it may mean on and after November the 5th. So I am truly delighted to introduce Ted Picone. Ted is a non-resident senior fellow for foreign policy at the Strobe Talbot Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Ted is a dear friend and a former colleague of mine at the Brookings, so I am biased towards him. All the same, I will say that I've come to know, respect, and appreciate Ted's intellectual rigor clarity, and political insight. And indeed, I have greatly benefited from all those traits over the years. We are very lucky to have him here to present his take on the conditions and the stakes for this election less than one month before Americans vote. And I would ask Ted in particular to shed some much needed light, either during his presentation or during the Q&A, on the global implications of this election for democracy and human rights, which is one of the subjects that he is deeply knowledgeable about. After Ted's presentation, I will moderate a discussion with him and Sana Toren Björling, US correspondent for Dagens Nyheter, one of Sweden's largest and most influential newspapers. I have had the privilege of being interviewed by Sana and I will do my best to ask similarly provocative and probing questions to stimulate a good conversation. And then we'll open the floor to all of you for your own questions and commentaries. So all told, it should be a fascinating event, one that does honor to international ideas mandate as a convener of discussions that advance our shared understanding of and commitment to democracy. So thank you again for joining us. And Ted, it is a pleasure to welcome you to International Idea, I think for the first time, and to invite you to come to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a real honor to be here. And thank you, Kevin, for that very generous introduction. And I've been following the work of International Idea for many, many years and continue to be so impressed with the important work that you are all doing, especially in this global super cycle of, of elections. Um, you know, international idea is really at the heart of what has become much more than a technical discussion about administering elections, but it's really become, it's at the essence of democratic integrity, our debates about how to do representative democracy. Um, so I'm gonna try to cover a lot of ground in a concise way as possible, uh, sensitive to the clock, but there's so much to say on this subject and it's so timely um, that I will, you know, have a lot to say, but I'm sure in the Q and A we'll also get to all these these topics. So as, as Kevin pointed out, for several decades, the trend line around the world bent toward expanding democracy across regions, cultures, religions, and ethnicities. And without recounting all the history, um, in the 80s and 90s, as the Cold War faded, we saw uh, increasing adoption of democratic forms of government. So the creation of an organization like International Idea in the midst of that and the statesmen and 
statesmanship and vision of leaders like Beng Saf Soderberg, uh, who we recently lost, are testaments to this, to this positive reality. When you think back to the year 2000, when I was working at the State Department, uh, this was the year the Community of Democracies was launched. Here's another example where governments came together to build a common platform of solidarity uh, to support democratic principles and cooperation. Unfortunately, since then, uh, overall global trends are negative, according to so many studies and international ideas, uh, Freedom House, The Economist, uh, groups I've worked with very closely, like the World Justice Project, which produces a rule of law index, the Bertelsmann Stiftung's Transformation Index. And across the board, these studies and many other scholarly work show the United States has also declined markedly in the quality of its democratic practices over the last five or 10 years. So unfortunately, American politicians like to talk about the US as a shining city on a hill and a model democracy others should emulate. The reality is that our democracy, US democracy is performing badly compared to others. And this is partly by design, if you go back to the framing uh, documents of our constitution and partly by practice and habit over many years. Americans increasingly understand this. Uh, according to a brand new Pew research poll, 72% of Americans say the US used to be a good example of democracy, but is not anymore. So I think that's an important recognition. And I wanna talk about some of the of the many deficits uh, in the US. Um, I think most importantly, we see a fragmentation of news uh, manipulated by disinformation, fueled by mostly unregulated social media, and now threatened further by artificial intelligence. So we have a, a shrinking common baseline of facts. And as we heard in a seminar this afternoon organized by International Idea, this has led to a disproportionate impact on women in particular, women including political leaders who are victims of all kinds of harassment and discrimination, doxing, revenge porn, et cetera. Second problem, we have a very poor level of civic education. So the participation numbers may look good. In fact, underneath that is a really not a strong understanding of how our democracy works. And on top of that, digital literacy is quite weak. We have forms of both legal and illegal corruption in the United States around our campaign finance system um, and dark money. And Kevin knows this subject very well and can say more about it. There's an increasing fear and hatred of the other, this intense polarization and distrust among neighbors and fellow citizens, and a growing sense of cynicism and despair, um, particularly among, among the youth. Why? Well, I think migration and the changing demographics of the country have a lot to do with this latter trend. And this is being stoked by certain politicians who claim the United States whether they say this explicitly or implicitly, should return to a system and a culture dominated by white Christian nationalists. Now, on the other hand, you could say maybe there's an, too much focus on what I would call our micro identities that make it harder to build coalitions around broader social goals that privilege public goods over private gains. I want to quote here President Clinton, who recently spoke at a service I attended, in which he said, are we to be guided by our fascinating differences or by our common humanity? I think that's a fundamental question we all need to address. I want to elaborate on three systemic areas in which US democratic practices are under real pressure and are on the ballot in some ways. When you look at the fundamentals of public administration and good governance, you know, we and many other liberal democracies function well because we have a professional and competent administrative state. 
the so-called nameless bureaucrats who are actually building expertise and faithfully carrying out the laws, providing good policy options to leaders, um, et cetera. Now, that doesn't mean they always get it right, um, but we have a system to challenge their conclusions. And as we saw uh, during COVID, um, not getting it right, but our process allows parties to challenge and contest their findings, and in many cases, overrule their decisions. I was a political appointee in the Clinton administration, and I can attest to the value of this dynamic tension between the administrative civil service and political appointees who have a mandate by the voters who elected the president uh, to carry out that mandate and to do so in a way that is functional and effective. Um, and that is a healthy tension. Unfortunately, we have on the campaign agenda um, a document called Project 2025 um, that proposes to flip this script and replace thousands of experienced and dedicated public servants with their own hand-picked ideological allies. And if, if this is implemented, uh, it would, I think, deteriorate the functioning of government. Second, systemic problem, elections. The same civil servants are referred to at the state and local level, and many citizen volunteers run our elections to make sure they're well publicized and voting happens in accordance with the rules and the votes are counted accurately. You'd think after all these years of elections in the United States, this would not be a particularly complex exercise. And for the most part, it has taken place without much fanfare or controversy, except when it's a particularly close election, as we saw in 2000, for example. But because we're living in a different, a more intense era of polarization uh, controlled by the two political parties, the elections process is receiving greater scrutiny, greater controversy, conspiracy theories, and even violence. There's a new poll just out this week by Gallup on the public perceptions among Americans of the integrity of our election system. And this is really worrisome. There's a partisan gap. So 84% of Democrats express confidence in the vote counting process and only 28% of Republicans. So this is really at the heart of this um, controversy that's being stoked uh, right from the top on down. And I'll say another word about that later. Third, federalism. We have a very important feature, other democracies do, um, where power is divided between the national and the state levels and further local levels. Um, and that includes how elections are managed, which is a weakness and a strength because it does allow, um, it prevents any kind of centralized hacking of, a, of an election, um, but it's also very hard to manage. We don't have a national election administration or commission. Um, it's good in that decisions that affect citizens are so local, so people have more of a stake and can talk to their councilman and their local representative. And as Alexis de Tocqueville observed, this is one of the strengths of democracy, more grassroots, more pragmatic. Um, but we need to strike the right balance because if we err too much toward local control, we may lose respect for fundamental rights and equality before the law guaranteed to all Americans. We fought a civil war over this issue, amended our constitution to ensure that no one has fewer constitutional rights just because of this state they happen to live in or the color of their skin. The ongoing fight over a woman's right to choose goes to the heart of this tension between federal and state control. So those are three just systemic issues I wanted to highlight, but now I want to talk, and it is a gloomy day and it's going to get gloomier, um, about something much more fundamental that we're facing. A rejection of the normal rules of the game of democratic politics, in which the certified winner of free and fair elections takes power peacefully from the losing party. So we're facing a new era of, as Kevin reminded me at lunch today, 
what we would call election denialism. This kind of zero sum approach to political power culminated in the insurrection of January 6. And it continues to wreak havoc with over 60% of Republicans taking the position that Joe Biden did not win in 2020, despite the lack of any credible evidence of fraud and after months of investigation and litigation. We also have what happened on January 6th, the insurrection, and holding those responsible that day. It's, it's mired in the courts. Hundreds have been prosecuted. They're being challenged. Um, and it generates a lot of frustration with our increasingly politicized judicial system. And then you have Donald Trump and his vice presidential candidate and his allies who lionize the rioters expects to pardon them and refuses to say if they will accept the results of next month's election unless of course he wins in some one of the two major political parties has turned away from and is attacking the fundamental democratic rules of the game in my view this is one of the cardinal sins of democracy and is highly likely to lead to direct conflict if another close election results in November, which I think most people expect. It's really rare in history for a mainstream political party to just turn away from this essential feature of democracy so quickly. Um, and the best comparison that I've heard from historians is in the Democratic Party, the former Democratic Party, after our Civil War. Okay, that's gloomy. I have a long list of ideas and remedies to address some of these problems. I'm conscious of the time. Um, maybe I'll just mention a couple of them. Okay. <laughs> We've learned a couple of lessons. There was a, an important bill uh, adopted that addresses some of the problems with our electoral college um, and the loophole that appeared in 20. 20 with the counting um, uh, on January 6. So that's positive, but there's a lot more we need to do. So one thing we could do is take the elections out of the hands of the two major political parties and create independent electoral commissions at the state and federal levels so that disputes can be resolved quickly by neutral arbiters, not politicians, not a patchwork of judges with different rulings, and you see this is a common feature in most stable democracies. We need a fundamental reform of our campaign finance system. We need to limit big dollar donations, expand public financing, uh, make these political action committees reveal their donors, and eliminate dark money. I now live in the state of Maine after 30 years in Washington, DC. And Maine is a rather innovative place in our country. Um, we have an initiative on our ballot this fall that says limit any political contributions to $5,000. Um, so that I'm guessing that will pass quite easily. Um, that's the kind of thing we need to see more of. So what else? Well, look at how Congress is operating. It's very dysfunctional. The polarization is intense and increasingly the majority will is not being reflected in their decisions. Um, you have a factional control, for example, of the filibuster, um, which is in virtually minority control of the agenda. And when this happens, these stalemate happens, then the vacuum is filled by executive power or judicial power or a marriage of the two. And what we've seen in particular lately is the important and I would say quite concerning Supreme Court decision, which has legitimized a broad category of so-called official acts of the president as immune from criminal penalty, regardless of their intention or effect. Uh, let me talk a bit about how to deal with polarization. You know, there are fundamental principles of peaceful coexistence and social cohesion that are being lost. A lot of concern about potential violence. Um, there's a practice in Maine, again, I'm going to refer to Maine, called ranked choice voting, 
um, which helps to bring citizens closer to the middle. You eliminate the extremes by voting preferences um, instead of a win-lose uh, outcome. And Maine is only one of two states that has this, this system. Um, we have lost sense of the common good. I referred to that before. And so some of these contentious issues can be addressed at the state level, but ultimately we do need to address them at the national level and reassert a sense of common, common purpose. Um, I'm gonna hold off there. I have some other thoughts about the Electoral College. I'll mention one other in terms of Maine um, and several other states have adopted rules that say even, I'll just give this a very specific example. Let's say Harris wins the popular vote, but Trump wins Maine. Maine would switch its electoral college votes to the winner of the national popular vote, which is quite interesting. And some might say it's a subversion of democracy. Wait, Maine voted for Trump. You're giving the electoral colleges votes to Harris. The reason for that would be we have one national office holder in the country, the president, who is supposed to represent all Americans. And we have this dichotomy of popular vote winners nationally, not winning the electoral college vote, or to put it reverse, electoral college vote winner doesn't win the national popular vote. So there's a concern, a legitimate concern about the majority and minority voices and who, how representative the White House is. I think going back to what happened in 2000 with the Gore versus Bush case, we learned that the United States does not have a constitutional right to vote. Americans do not have it in the constitution written clearly. This is unlike almost all other democracies. It's time to assert that as a, a fundamental right. Filibusters we can get into. I wanna mention the Supreme Court. We are all, the only established democracy with lifetime tenure on the high court. Um, so the average tenure is now 27 years since 1970. Um, and we need to catch up with other democracies on that front as well. Okay, that's my list of worries and of potential remedies that are obviously longer term. Why does this matter so much in our changing global context? We're in an era of rising authoritarians, um, China, Russia, power rising in Saudi Arabia, Iran, et cetera. And they are intentionally trying to undermine the post-war rules-based international order. So when, when the United States is strong, economically and on its politically, um, then it can work much better with like-minded partners to advance our mutual interests. Um, our economy is relatively strong, but our democracy is, is faltering. So I think our leadership role, the United States leadership role is on the ballot in November. So Kevin did a good job of summarizing the track record here. The United States has been a big promoter of the view that democracy is the best system of government. Um, and it kind of staked its claim for hegemony on that basis. Um, and it's quite bipartisan. Um, and this is true despite not living up to these practices at home or abroad. Um, and we have historically undermined democracy in the name of defeating communism or defeating terrorism. Um, and there are many examples. We can think Chile, Guatemala, Iraq, among others. But we've learned from some of these experiences. And I would say with some exceptions in the Trump administration, we have adopted democracy and human rights, not only as a value, but as a national security interest. This has become mainstreamed. Um, and you might call this pragmatic idealism or enlightened self-interest, but it's based on very solid evidence uh, that strong liberal democracies are safer they are more secure and they're better partners than authoritarian or weak regimes. Now, the greatest risk is these hybrid weak regimes. Um, they fail to exercise proper authority over their own territory and you have organized crime, 
high rates of violence, forced migration, civil wars in that middle gray zone. I did a report on this with Madeleine Albright at Brookings, and we really studied in depth the linkages between democracy and peace, democracy and terrorism, and criminal violence, gender security, et cetera. And we found that democracies obviously do, do not go to war uh, with one another. That has proven to be a historical fact. The greater threat is from non-democracies. And you only need to look nearby at Russia's ongoing attack on you, uh, democratizing Ukraine uh, to know that this is still a reality. I can go on other examples. Um, strong democracies do provide greater security for women, lower rates of violent crime and terrorism. So even if you have doubts about democracy as a system, if you think more narrowly uh, as an instrumental tool, it does lead to safer, more stable neighborhoods. So to deal with this, if the US is going to lead, it has to lead by example and improve its own performance at home. So this is another reason why these elections are so consequential this year. In conclusion, I'll summarize here and we can talk more afterwards. Every election is pivotal, um, but the particular contours and characters and timing of this one really feels existential. And I can say from many, many conversations with other Americans uh, in Maine and elsewhere that people are really feeling uh, very worried. Um, it's clear, we have two very clear alternatives um, for the White House. And I haven't even talked about Congress, but I think you get the picture. Uh, we know the players, we hear their rhetoric, um, we see their behavior. And ultimately, it's up to the voters to decide in November if they want to keep this Democratic Republic on course or experiment with something new and, and unpredictable. If the latter is chosen, the knock-on effects will be significant. The American people will have dealt, I believe, a grievous wound to itself in two ways. It will have severely damaged its ability to govern itself in accordance with liberal norms and risk domestic conflict. And second, it will gravely undermine its ability to play any global leadership role as a voice for democracy and against authoritarian rule. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ted, for, for that enlightening as much as sobering uh, presentation that gives us a lot to, to chew on. Uh, I think you, you did a, a very good job providing context to this election. I mean, historical context and also a review of the of the ills that need to be corrected in the workings of the political system and some of the ways to to go about it now i would like to go to sana talk about the dirty business of politics right and the, and about what's happening uh, precisely now on the ground the last time we spoke about a month ago i seem to remember you were touring the rural areas of Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, so I guess my question to you to kick off this discussion is, a, how do you see all these things that are not working in the American political system playing out on the ground? I mean, how do you, uh, what's your perception about polarization levels and the kinds of discussions that American citizens are having about the current 
election. Let's start there. Okay, thank you so much for for having me here. It's it's a great opportunity. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thanks for a great presentation. Of course, this is a huge question. And um, so I was the, the Dongis Nietas US correspondent from 13 to 17, and I lived in, in DC then. And then since then, I've been traveling a bit back and forth. And I just came back from um, a few weeks in, in Washington, New York, and then uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia. And I think, um, and I've written a couple of books on on American politics and one on on the political polarization. And I think that one, it came out. My first book came out four years ago, and I think it's still what struck me. It's what what the, the issues there are still the, the the questions I'm still thinking about, which is it's one thing to have different opinions about whatever issue, um, but if you don't share the same view on what the facts are what you talk about and i think that's kind of where we are and to a greater extent now than four years ago so i think one thing that is important to 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 see here is that first of all i think uh, what people agree on is that the system is not working and they don't like the polarization that they're seeing and that's a great thing that they actually agree uh, from left to right that no this is not working I can't even talk to my brother, I can't talk to my neighbor, I can't talk to my colleague, we can't talk about anything. We can't even talk about the weather anymore because you don't have the same view of climate change. They, they talk about sports or whatever, the apple fest that's going on in the community. Um, so, uh, so that's as a start. And then I think that they, you, you can see that they, you can also understand the big frustration that people do feel, especially out in the rural areas where they might feel the bad economy. And um, they are frustrated and they can, they're not, like sometimes you get questions from editors in, in Stockholm, but also from the very liberal cities. Like what are people, why are they voting for Trump? Are they like, what's wrong with them? And if you go around and travel and, and talk to people, you you don't totally know that, no, there's, there's not, they're not stupid. They're they're intelligent people, of course. They just make decisions based on on something else, and they see another their reality. They see they don't have money to. They see that things are expensive in the stores, and they see that they don't that Congress doesn't deliver. And then they're not stupid. They can totally see that, and they're frustrated, and they see that the big elites um, don't give them anything. And I, in to some extent, they're correct, right? Um, and then they draw different conclusions. And I think I think what's even more it's clear now is, of course, the information bubbles that you totally choose what kind of information you're served with. Um, you can tell that the what Trump and his um, and his campaign and some other people kind of around him, what they say is very effective. Like they put in the dots in in the electoral process. Um, when they talk about, for example, for the, as abortion is a big issue, and Trump knows that he doesn't win any votes by talking about abortion because he's no he knows that people support it. But when he says, "Well, I put it back to the states where people always wanted it," that's getting picked up. So even conservatives and Republicans who are for abortion abortion rights, they say, "Well, you know, we support Trump in this issue as well because he put it back to the states." So you can kind of hear it, um, and they do, they mistrust. Um, I think that's also like even if there is a civil servant that is apolitical, I don't think that they trust that person either because mm -hmm. they will see that no 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 only liberals run the, run it all. We know it. That it's the same thing as that when they look at universities or colleges, they say, no, 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 we don't trust them at all. I don't know if I even want my kids to go to college because they come back and they vote for Bernie Sanders. I don't like, I don't like. Mm -hmm. So I think it's become so, it's um, really identity based. That's also what the research that you do, um, that it shows that it's become um, the proof or whatever, it doesn't really stick. It's very emotional. I think that's also important to know that the, the biggest values, they, they start with emotions and then we can't rationalize whatever emotions we have. 
So it becomes very hard to convince you to change. I mean, look at ourselves. Like we don't really like to change our minds, do we? It's pretty hard to change your mind. Like we prefer to put in the arguments we get from whatever to kind of fit whatever we already believe. I don't know if that was a, a, an answer to it was just a first. This thought. is great. This is great. It, it, look, I have. I have a couple of questions for both of you. I mean, one about the past and one about the future. The one about the past is, uh, well, I mean, it is very clear to me that whatever problems we identify with the workings of the political system in the US did not start with Trump. I mean, Trump in a way is a consequence of previous trends. A, what went wrong? What went wrong that engendered the kind of things that we're talking about? I mean, the, the, the utter loss of trust in institutions, the cynicism, the, the kind of attitude of, you know, we have nothing to lose. We can throw our lot with what you call a, a Ted, very aptly, the, the unpredictable option. I mean, what, what went wrong? And, and, and here I'm hinting at something that Sana mentioned, the, the question of how elites are perceived and, and the resentment that it has been brewing there for, for, for a time. So I would like you to, to say a word about that. And then the question about the future, a, I, I hear you, Ted, when you list a number of things, mostly institutional remedies that can be put in place to deal with extreme polarization and with some of the things that are happening. The question is, who is the agent of that? I mean, where does the driving force to push for that agenda will come from? Because the fact of the matter is that there are a number of political actors that that profit from the current polarization uh, environment, right? So my question is, who's gonna who's gonna break the cycle, and how? How do you see this playing out? Yep. Well, I first would like to. Um endorse or agree with so much of what Sana said. And I felt it have felt it personally in conversations that we've had uh, at home with friends and neighbors who have different realities and completely different realities in terms of how they understand what's actually going on every day. So that's really hard to overcome in the fragmented news environment that we have. How did we get here? Um, I think a lot of us point back to the recession of 2008 as a time when uh, people really lost faith in Wall Street and the big business environment um, for what happened there. But it really just exacerbated something already going on, which is years and years of growing inequality um, and the inability or the difficulty that lower middle classes have to rise the ladder, which is really very different from way, the way things used to be. Um, I'm the grandson of poor Italian immigrants, and in one generation, my father was able to climb the ranks very quickly, um, and that's much harder now, and people feel it. They feel quite frustrated, um, and so I think that gives naysayers a big opportunity to kind of play that against uh, the, the political system, accuse everyone, all the elites. Um, the other fundamental reality is, you know, money in politics. I mean, that inequality fuels a certain um, reinforcement of, hey, I if I have a lot of money, I like this status quo. It favors me, low taxes, less regulation, et cetera. And they will feed that money into their political candidates or parties that push that agenda. And the political, the politicians are beholden to them because we don't have we have very limited public financing. And so they go around hat in hand. And this has been going on for decades. I used to work for a congressman from Pennsylvania 
And he would have to leave the office every day, go to the Democratic National Committee headquarters and just dial for dollars all day. That's all he did. It's like, wait, aren't we supposed to be governing? Like there are debates on the House floor. Of course he did his job, but that, that was 30 years ago and it's only gotten worse. So that is one of the fundamental root causes of our, of our problem. I'll leave it there. Yeah, so I, I so interesting what you what you say. I think also when you track back polarization, it's I think income inequality is one of the biggest drivers because you can people don't have anything, they lose trust in each other and they don't see that the elites will do anything for them. And I also think in the US you can track it back to even kind of the late seventies, I think, where where people were most kind of even and then I think the the early '90s, when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House, I think that was also very kind of strategic way of of creating. Also, it's not only bottom up; it's also top down, where the Republican Party has deliberately gone further to the right. And I think that was that's also kind of being enforced by the political system that makes politics more extreme than the electorate is, mm -hmm. because the prime the the system with primaries um, kind of enforces that, and you get more extreme. So when the, the abortion issue is is only one where where politics has become more extreme than people really appreciate, and then kind of, but then it gets into a circle that reinforces itself, and then the ball is too heavy to it just rolls and becomes stronger. Uh, of course, the money. Um, I think also another thing that has been important here as a journalist. Um, the death of local journalism in the in the U.S. is a very strong trend. It's, it's strong in in many countries, including Sweden, but in in the United States, it's become even. It's such a remarkable shift. How many newspapers that have shut down, and uh, and when news and journalists are seen more on a national level, they are also seen as a part of the elite, and they are seen especially now on, it's the same thing with what you mentioned before, where, where the trust in, in government is much larger among Democrats than Republicans. We see the same as in trust in journalism. Uh, but I think what, what adds to it is that when people don't know a journalist, they don't know a reporter, before they might have a reporter that was also kind of on the baseball, local baseball club, or in the grocery, you met them at the grocery store, there was somebody you knew. And when that isn't around anymore, I think that it's much easier to uh, dismiss them. And another part of this is that people, when they know their local government and they know that the local mayor, whatever, is corrupt, um, they, it's kind of going around, they, they know it, but they don't have any, there are no reporters at the city hall looking at the, kind of digging into it. It's the same really here and a lot of the big, of scandals, they often begin in a local setting that national reporters never get to. And I think that has also added to the big, the, the media scene that has kind of increased this. Um, there are so many factors into this, but I think that's also another important thing. Can I just come to yeah. So I, all of that I agree with. Um, there is an interesting, a counterfactual here that suggests that government does work from time to time. And if you look at, and I'm not trying to be partisan about this, but we did have a big debate about healthcare in our country and finally did pass legislation that allowed millions of Americans to access healthcare that they couldn't before. So you look at this, that one issue. Now, I think for the people affected, there was like, huh, well, that, okay, it helped me a little bit, but I still have all these rising costs and we don't have good childcare. And okay, there are many problems. Affordable housing, by the way, is a huge problem around the country. Um, or you look at the money that's been spent, well, COVID, I mean, my God, talk about trillions of dollars being thrown at that problem. And like literally, checks coming in the mail that people got them through that crisis. That was a government response that you could say worked. Now it also fueled inflation. So, and there are many other factors for that, but I think that's another concern there. Now you have this big, big pot of money going into infrastructure and going into fighting climate change. 
Um, so in, and some of these are very bipartisan. I mean, they could not have passed without bipartisan support. So there is sometimes we lose sight that there actually is a functioning middle there where uh, we can get things done. Um, but we're so focused on the extremes and the polarization that sometimes we, we lose sight of that. Um, I will let you off the hook on the question of the agent, the agent of change. Uh, what gives you hope, if anything, that the fever will break at some point? Is there anything in whatever you see around you that gives you hope that uh, that at some point the the tide of dysfunction that we are seeing uh, in U.S. political dysfunction will subside. We can all be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that that would be a good thing, right? Because we it's such a many people I talk to they say, well, I think things will get much worse before they get better. Um, that's what you kind of hear from both sides, really. Um, and it's hard to see right now a way of like breaking it, except for the fact that people want to break it. But how that could work, I don't know. Uh, it's, I think it's um, because you need, as you as you said before, to 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 really change something. You um, you need to get the people on board who benefits from the current system as well. Um, and there is, I think there was a lot of support for like changing the, um, how this, how the institutions work. Um, but to actually do it, I, I think that's, um, it's a very tricky question. Um, I don't know. I think that the states, what we can see is that the different states are becoming much different from one another. Mm -hmm. So, so people have start already started moving from one state to another because they, uh, but then you also see the tension within the state between the urban and the rural areas, for example. Um, but as you said, um, you can also see the nuances within, yeah, people are complex people. They can work together when they know each other, usually. I don't know if you see yeah. more positive. So I think the hope and agency go together in, in my response. I think this election has really galvanized a lot of people who maybe didn't get involved as much in the past because they see the, the threat and the risks. When you, you know, we've already seen Trump in office. We know what that looks like. We all lived through January 6th. Um, and the fact that he could come back again into power is causing people to wake up and say, well, wait a second, you know, this is going too far. Um, and this is true, including among many people in the Republican Party um, and on Wall Street and in the business community who are beginning to say, well, wait a second, we, we want an independent central bank. Um, we think that's important to our business world. We, we want strong independent judiciaries. That rule of law matters to our business interests. And I would like to see more of them speak out on that because they still are invested in the status quo, but they're beginning to identify that risk and speaking out or even quietly, you know, speaking to others. So there's a little bit hope there. It's a question of how all this would coalesce into real change. You know, our states do tend to be laboratories of democracy. I've mentioned many examples in Maine, but I'd like to see more of that. Um, it's true what you're saying about self-segregation. People are moving to the states where they feel more comfortable, but that is leading toward this disparity of, you know, if I live there, I have certain rights, but if I'm a woman, if I live there, I don't have those same rights. And that just undercuts the whole notion of equality before the law. So we have um, that big problem in front of us. And until we see, I think, some more charismatic leaders, it's so strange. It almost feels like a dream that we had Barack Obama for eight years. I mean, think about that. An African-American elected twice who came out of nowhere as a community organizer and a state senator. Um, and, you know, he attracted a lot of votes from blue collar workers, from union people, the same people who are voting for Trump now. So I think there is, at the end of the day, this economic 
concern that people feel in their daily lives and somehow have attached themselves to Trump as the answer. And I, I can't really explain that. I think the other last point is that the Republican Party is so divided, even though it doesn't look that way, at least on the elite level, they're very divided. And so if Trump loses, that will be, and then we see what conflict emerges. But I think it will be time then for the Republicans to say, we've got it. We've got to get past Trump. We need a whole new platform here, new leaders. That could be a window of opportunity if the right people get engaged and lead the party more toward the middle. Because I think the Democrats are already there, frankly. Of course, we have debates in Democratic Party with progressives far left pushing for certain things. But it's really they don't have the power to really move the needle. And so that's one way it could play out. Before we uh, open up the floor for questions, uh, Ted, very, very, very quickly, I mean, you touched upon this in your presentation, but I would like to elaborate for a couple of minutes on the question of the global ramifications, because that's one that is obviously very germane uh, to what we do here at IDEA. Uh, Two possible results. How do you see, you know, the the global ramifications of each? Two very different results. And again, we know what this looks like from Trump's first term. Um, it's America first, and it's also unpredictable. And that's part of it by design. You know, it's chaos, and we don't want people to know what we're going to do next. And we want it that way. Um, so who knows? I mean, he could go this way or that way. But fundamentally, he does truly believe in an America first uh, approach, including, of course, on trade, um, big increase in tariffs. Um, maybe we'll see some more trade wars. Um, how that affects American people is a whole other question and getting that through to people's minds. But some important um, tensions emerging there. I think the other, when you break it down into more security related issues, I mean, the greatest concern I have is, is Ukraine. Uh, you know, we've seen over and over again that Trump consistently favors Putin's Russia and many Republicans also will get in line with him. It's not uniform, but I think that's a real threat uh, that we'll see. Um, US pressure on Russia fall back and Ukraine will suffer as a result. Um, things like multilateral affairs, governance, UN, um, we're seeing some traction in getting toward UN reform, but Trump will mostly walk away from a lot of the international institutions as we saw last time, whether it's the International Criminal Court or whether we pay our dues on time and many other factors. I've done a lot of work around the UN Human Rights Council. The US will probably withdraw. Um, then you have Israel-Palestine. You know, this has turned out to be of great concern. Um, we were talking about what effect this could have on the vote in Michigan with a larger Arab American community. It could hurt the Democrats. But there is a very, very strong pro-Israel faction say on both parties and so if trump wins he's going to i think turbocharge that in support of netanyahu and his uh, scorched earth approach and so potential and then you have iran so potential for even more conflict in in the middle east i see that uh, as well yeah can please. i just one little thing i, I was so, so I think it was a Gallup uh, or Gallup or Pew um, talking about what uh, the electorate, how they want the U.S. role in the world to be. And it was interesting because I, I didn't I didn't really I hadn't seen that before, but that the difference um, there is difference between the parties, but there's also a big difference in age and where the younger voters, the below 35 year olds, they want a lesser global involvement from the US. And the more the older people get, the more of the traditional kind of US as a speak up for democracy and for human rights. And I, I don't know how that will influence also the candidates because they they need the young votes. 
and I think that's also an interesting, like the younger people, um, I mean, Trump has already been up on the political scene for almost 10 years and they were kids when he came out there. I think that's, that's also something that's interesting. And what will happen with the Republican party after Trump is, I think it's super interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's kind of too late to reform the whole party, I think many people in the US, they really would like to see a multi-party system, but mm -hmm. the system is not created to, it's, it's oh, that's another reform that's so hard to see. It's they're, they're kind of stuck with the two parties and it's not, it's a bit unfortunate because I think there are a lot of people who would like to see a third or a fourth party being a really an active party, maybe not like nine or eight, eight like we have in Sweden, because that, that has its own kind of complicated <laughs> results as we've seen. It's interesting. I mean, this question about the the attitudes of the part of young people towards the U.S. global role, I have to think that that's also a function of of the experience, you know, with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, that. You know the the shadow of that has been very very long right so uh, the floor is open uh, please identify yourselves when you ask a question and and please do ask a question right and try to be very very concise thank you massimo and then there's another question here perhaps we can take two or three uh, thank you. I'm Massimo Tombasoli. Uh, I'm director of global programs here at IDEA. Uh, I have two quick questions. One is uh, uh, about leadership. You have been talking a lot, uh, Ted, about uh, uh, Trump, uh, but this is a very strange campaign. We had uh, Trump versus Biden. Then we had a change in uh, the candidacy uh, on the Democrat side. And uh, one of the questions that many had uh, was about why is it that we, uh, we can only see old candidates running for um, office in, in, uh, in the US, why there are no younger candidates. And eventually this changed after a TV debate, which is another very strange uh, thing because it, it brings us back to the time of uh, uh, Nixon versus uh, Kennedy. No, how influential was the TV debate in that era, and how still influential the TV debate is uh, nowadays when we talk of uh, digitalization and social media. And uh, th the second question is about uh, coherence. Uh, many of the uh, recipes that you indicated for the solutions are the things that US democracy building institutions try to instill when they work abroad in other countries in order to strengthen others democracies independence of electoral authorities money in politics so how does it play these uh, in the field of democracy systems uh, what is the credibility of democracy systems when one of the main democracies in the world is affected by the very issues that um, US and other democracy assistance providers are trying to support abroad. Thank you, Massimo. There's another one. There's another one here. Please, the lady in the front. Please identify yourself. My name is Nurten Skoray. I'm a sociologist. Um, my question is to both of you. You talked about the leadership of United States in promoting democracy worldwide. But when we look at how it played out in the world during the last 70 years, other than the glorious intervention, military intervention during the Second World War, which saved Europe, uh, I don't remember any democratic uh, uh, support from the United States other than containing Soviet influence and uh, supporting coup d'etats in the countries to take down the socialist governments. What do you say about that? Thank you. I'll leave that to Ted. There's another one there, and then we go back. Thank to you speak. so much. Thank you for interesting interventions. I'm Irina Shulginioni. I'm um, Ambassador for Human Rights and Democracy at the Swedish MFA. 
And I'm curious about um, understanding a little bit better what you said, Ted, about the popular vote and the system that you had now in Maine. I mean, it, it seems for, for us Swedes, it's very strange, the whole thing with the, uh, you know, your system. But if you, on top of that, can have different systems in different states, how does that work? And if you could also comment on to what extent do you think that that would affect the interest amongst, amongst the general public to actually go and vote? Thank you. Thank you. Go back to the, to the speakers now. I mean, please take whichever question you think you can contribute to. Um, okay, I'll start with the one on the leadership then, just firstly. The, um, I think a lot of people are upset also in the US with the old guys <laughs> running for office. I think as I understand it, Biden, um, a lot of people also within the Democratic Party wanted him to step down way earlier, like after the midterms would have been a great opportunity for him to just say, well, wow, we did better than we thought. And this is and then leave the whole the whole field open. But then I, I guess he didn't want to. And they thought that he could Well, the first time in 2020, they he was chosen because he was considered the, the person who could beat Trump. And when he didn't want to step aside, I think that's also one of the reforms you suggested, like to separate the the kind of the electoral process also from the parties. And I think they he was impossible. It was impossible for them to to tell him to step aside. And and I guess they were just too afraid to hurt his feelings. I think it's it it's amazing. I think that so little has been said about the actual the Democratic Party um, that is that is also to blame for putting him forward, I think. And I think you can still hear critical comments also from the left, the way that Kamala Harris was kind of mm -hmm. where she, how she came to be the candidate with no big debate or, uh, but of course it's a sign of weakness. There are of course plenty of people that are smart people, but I th also think that some say that well, you know, the smartest people, the people we really want to have to be in office, they're too smart to choose to be to be in that game. They they're sick and tired of like just dealing with collecting money. Yeah. They they choose other careers. Um, that's kind of one comment on that. I'll leave you okay. come to the others. Yeah, just on on this topic, I mean, I think you're right, uh, and we're seeing it in both parties. These incumbents who get re-elected time and time again this goes back to the money system and the way it works um, and the more you're in office the more power you accumulate in, in congress as senior members of various committees uh, so it's an, an endless cycle um, and it's true that we uh, we are the whole biden way it went down was fascinating i think the democrats were uh, very worried with Biden losing to, to Trump. And so a lot of us, I'm going to speak in a partisan way, were, were relieved uh, when he's finally stepped aside. I think Kamala had to be chosen pragmatically because there was not enough time for a contested primary at that point. Um, now, term limits, uh, it's probably time to put back on the agenda. That's another reform I should have mentioned. Uh, we have lots of term limits at the state level and it's time to bring them to the federal level. And I think people are getting that. Um, on some of these other questions, I should have explained a little bit further on the electoral college popular vote issue. So the way it's playing out, there's a, current, there's a compact among states, some states, to uh, switch the popular vote, switch their electoral college vote to the pop, national popular vote winner. But you need a certain um, majority number of states for it to have any effect in terms of how the vote would actually go down at the Electoral College. They don't have that number of states agreeing to this. I think 14 states have done it. They need 27 in order for it to have effect. So right now, it's just really a hypothetical. It's not going to happen. 
um, until they get to a higher majority of states agreeing to this change. But I think it's also more of a political tool to prod the debate about we need to reform the Electoral College. It just doesn't work. I mean, it just doesn't this disconnect between the popular vote and, and the outcome. And it's also a way of doing it without going, without changing the Constitution. Exactly. That you can do it yeah, without, yeah, you can actually do it. You don't have to do away with the Electoral right. College itself. Exactly. So that's what's going on there. Um, in terms of credibility of US democracy assistance, um, I think it's time and some democracy promoters in the US uh, understand this, for the US to step back and say, we need to learn from others. You know, we're not very good at that. And, um, but I know, for example, um, some NGOs in the US that are beginning to bring that home. There's a campaign for election administration, independent election bodies at the state level that's barring from international experience explicitly to say, this is what we need in the United States. So hopefully some of that innovation will circle back. I, I think the other um, phrase we use a lot in the democracy promotion community is that um, democracies make so many mistakes and they're imperfect. Um, but they learn how to self-correct. We have self-correcting mechanisms in democracies that allow for a, you know, steering back toward um, some middle without a complete collapse of the system, which you do see more in authoritarian or weak regimes. I like that. I like the sound of that, but what worries me is in the United States right now, and I reference this, but underscore it, we have fewer and fewer checks on executive power. The Supreme Court decision and the politicization of the Supreme Court fundamentally um, is, is of concern uh, for our ability to self-correct. There are fewer and fewer constraints. Um, so. I, I also just think that it's, sorry, no, no, no. I, well, I didn't answer this question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah, but go ahead. No, but if it, just a small thing on this: that it's um, even if the U.S. has, as you mentioned, has done a, made a lot of mistakes or hasn't done what it said as it would do. I think in all and kind of threatens to withdraw from big international organizations. The world would be not be the same if the United States was not there as a partner. And sometimes we forget also that a lot of like the biggest aid donor in the world is still the United States like in terms of what it does in, in poor countries. And sometimes we, we do forget like that the, the, there's no other country in that is as good in like huge logistical operations that the United States is. And I think sometimes we, we kind of forget that so much money, even if it's small compared to the military expenses, for example, it's still like on the, on the, world stage is still a lot of resources going into it. And, and I think Americans in general still have this impulse, even those that might want to see the US withdraw a bit toward generosity, particularly for humanitarian crises. And so I think that um, funding support and it's bipartisan would, would largely continue. But on the coups matter, um, yes, your critique is, is correct, but I would update it and say that more recently, there has been a recognition that direct intervention in trying to decide, pick a winner in a particular country doesn't work. It backfires, particularly, I'll say, from the Latin America perspective. And Obama explicitly walked away and said, we will not support coups um, as a matter of policy. And I think that is where we're at currently. Um, we have learned so, some lessons now. What happens behind the scenes and skullduggery by intelligence agencies, maybe we'll learn more someday. But in general, um, I think that situation has improved. Yeah, just, just to add something to this last comment, I, I, think, I think it's a fair critique. Uh, yet, it is important to imagine a the counterfactual, the counterfactual to a, a world in which the U.S. Uh, was not a dominant geopolitical actor. And essentially, the counterfactual is what we're starting to see. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. Uh, so, you know, uh, for all the flaws that we saw 
over the past 70 years, I much rather take that kind of world than the alternatives, right? But that's me. You don't have to agree with me. Um, I don't know, Nasifa, if there are any questions coming from our participants online. If you could read perhaps a couple of those, two or three, we have like 10 more minutes. Yeah, so there are two online questions. One is from Mexico, and it says, what do you make of the fact that the future of the world, considering the situation in Ukraine, the Middle East, and some other places, are in the hands of a limited number of voters in Pennsylvania? And the second question is, uh, in what ways could the US election influence the global state of democracy? including the spread of democratic values, election integrity, and support for democratic institutions worldwide. Yeah. What can you say? I mean, Pennsylvania or Michigan or uh, it's true. It could it could be that that a few thousand votes actually decide. The future for very many people, even if it's very complicated. Um, we will just have to see what happens, right? And um, on the other question, I think it's um, um, it's what what also what you, the latest democracy report from idea says is that it, what happens in the U.S. is an inspiration for other countries uh, for who for for whatever like whoever wins. So if Trump wins, I think it's it will affect democracy in in the world as well um and if harris wins it would be the same i think so i think um the ideas and the resources and the it it energizes whoever side wins so i think it will have it would be very consequential you know if you have it yeah i think um in pennsylvania uh and the other swing states for everyone else who doesn't live in a swing state, there's a lot of frustration <laughs> that it all comes down to so few voters. So it's a flaw in our system. And it's one of the reasons there's a movement to change um, toward this popular vote would win. Um, it's it's broken. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. No, I just want to say that I've actually met people in Pennsylvania who sit there and I've met one of the swing voters that hasn't actually made up their mind between the two candidates. And I didn't really know that they existed. I thought that either you knew what to vote for or you were considering like either vote or not vote at all. But I met this woman who said, you know, I'm still, uh, you know, there are good things with both candidates. I haven't really done that yet. Like, it's just interesting to, to know that they're actually, they do exist. Yeah, yes, they do exist. There are fewer and fewer yeah. of them. Um, on the on the other question, I'm not sure I have more more to add, but I would like to say that here we are in Europe, and in Sweden, and in this building that you know the Swedish government and people have been so supportive of this work that uh, we're going to have a vacuum if Trump wins in terms of this work, and we're going to we those concerned about this um, will need to fill the vacuum, uh, and I think Europe has to be in the lead and both European Union and individual European governments. And I think what's going on in Europe is absolutely fascinating. The building of a, a supranational entity that still retains local democratic elements. Um, it's the building of, of a new kind of experiment that I find very inspiring and encouraging. Um, I think you have more checks and balances in moving toward the middle because of parliamentary systems that reinforce that. Um, so and I see that as a bright spot if European voters are willing to kind of go in that direction and leaders. It, it, just a couple couple of comments and one final question. I mean, the, the one factoid, I mean, just yesterday I was reading, you know, to the question about Pennsylvania, just yesterday I was reading that in the course of this campaign, over $300 million will be spent in advertising in Pennsylvania, which is an insane amount of money. I mean, it, those guys must be going nuts, literally, <laughs> right? So uh, that's number one. The, the second 
uh, the second, and this is the, the, the question that I have for both of you. A lot of what we have been discussing, uh, particularly in terms of the polarization that we see in the US, is connected to the media environment. Um, again, uh, you, Ted, mentioned a series of institutional remedies to some of these things. But is it begs the question, you know, how effective that will be ultimately to mitigate polarization when you have a media environment that generates this kind of a alternative and separate realities. So the question I ask myself and I ask you is what is to be done about that if we more or less agree that this is a fundamental driver of polarization, what is to be done about that? Well, as a reporter, I'm thinking about this a lot. I think uh, a lot of people who you talk to say that we need some kind of regulation on social media, the big, the big, uh, big tech. I think now, um, I think we as journalists think a lot about like, how do you, how do you report on things without just feeling that you preach for the choir? How do you try to reach somebody else? Can you even do that? And a lot of what, especially in the United States, where this is much more, much stronger than in Sweden, where we still have some kind of, the, the situation here is just totally different. Mm -hmm. um, there, a lot of the so-called mainstream media, which is like the big established media, um, they, what they report is often dismissed by a, a large group of, of uh, mostly right-wing um, voters. And they don't even take it into account. They just say that it's not right just because it comes from a certain point. And I think that's a really, I think that one big question that I think about a lot is how do we cover anti-democratic movements and, and authoritarian leaders uh, without totally kind of dismissing their potential voters and sympathizers. How do we separate them from, from the people that we would like to, to reach? I think it's very, I think it's very tricky. I don't have an answer to that. I can tell you, I talked to this young guy, it's, he was only 17, so he couldn't, he, he won't be able to vote in this election. He worked at this gas station just outside of Butler uh, in Pennsylvania. And I asked him what, cause I tend to ask everybody where they get their information. And he's, he mentioned a few kind of right, far right platforms like YouTube channels and other. Uh, and, I, and I said to him, you know, there are a lot of conspiracy, conspiracy theories around. How do, you, how do you know what's a conspiracy and what's really a fact? Like, how do you, how do you think? And he, he kind of smiled and he said, well, you know, I use my gut feeling. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I believe most things, but if it kind of seemed far out, I don't believe it. And then as a thing that he wouldn't believe, it mentioned some kind of tax um, suggestion that came from the Democrats, I think. And he wouldn't believe that. No, 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 you can't. You can never have a system with whatever, mm. childcare, that wouldn't work. Um, but so that that is kind of frightening. Um, I don't I don't know how you would do it, but I think that to kind of somehow break the filter bubbles. And I think there is a, it is a huge debate about social media right now on how this works. Um, so I guess that will continue. It won't change anytime soon, but I think it will, it has to start there, I think. I'll just speak uh, to what I'm experiencing in the US. Um, we have a very, very strong uh, protection of free expression. And this is getting the way of regulating social media other things as well, but that's a key factor in understanding it. So I don't have much hope that we'll actually get in front of it. Um, and it's true, we, our, our media information space is so polluted with not only segmented, but disinformation yeah. is rampant and the rise of conspiracy theories um, is particularly worrisome. So I wish I had a good answer. Um, I do see in some places a move toward protecting uh, local journalism. There are some places 
because the business model has collapsed largely. So they need to find new sources of income and philanthropists are filling the void in some cases, but I don't know how long-term sustainable that is. Um, but I haven't given hope I haven't given up hope that uh, we'll get some protection of local journalism. But at the national level, it's really hard. Like we need something new. We need some kind of new common platform that people will pay attention to. Um, and I, I don't know what that is, but what's working, it, what's happening now is not working. I would just say one last thing. Interesting what's happening in Brazil, where Brazil has stepped in the court and said, sorry, uh, X, Twitter, you're gone way beyond the boundaries here. We need to protect our democracy and shut them down. That would never happen in the United States. I mean, look at the platform that Elon Musk has right now and how disruptive he is. Um, I didn't want to end on a sad note, but um, <laughs> you have something hopeful to say? <laughs> it's not entirely sad. I, I mean, if you ask me, I think what the Brazilians did, what the Electoral Tribunal of Brazil did to protect Brazilian democracy, and not just the tribunal, also the courts, when they held to account the people that organized the, the insurrection that took place uh, a couple of years after it happened in the US. Uh, I mean, the, the, the first, prerequisite of a democratic order is being able to protect itself. I think the Brazilian democracy has passed that test with flying colors. I cannot say the same thing about the US, sadly. So, uh, I mean, I, there's, there's some interesting stuff happening in other, in other places that the US would do well to, to at least look into. Well, time is up. But this has been a wonderfully interesting and enlightening discussion about institutional things, about sociological things, uh, about what's happening on the ground. So I, I think uh, I speak for all of us when I say that I feel privileged to have had this opportunity with both of you. And I will ask everybody here to give a round of applause to our wonderful speakers. And I hope both of you will be back uh, here. You're always uh, welcome. So thank you so much.